It's like no, none of us ever stayed at a Marriott property and said that was a transformative experience. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the, and I'm, I'm being facetious, but there's there's no life to that experience. It's yeah. very much a practical uh, cog that fits into an overnight experience somewhere. Whereas mm. this is something where I mean, we don't have community in New York in the mm. same way that we have it. We could have it in the. So I guess for the purposes of the video, could you paint in broad strokes what the vision is for it? Uh, from the perspective of your history and uh, what you see that it could be? Sure. You know, to me it's just devastating what's happened with the overdevelopment in the area. So when I started coming in 77 and I was 14, it was just paradise. I mean, it was like living on, you know, Treasure Island or whatever. I mean, just palm trees and pristine waters and, and very few people and, um, uh, you know, healthy living. I mean, we ate what we fished and what we could buy at the store, which is grown in the local uh, ranches surrounding the community, which was very small at the time. Being that it has every possible element that would attract tourists, it was inevitable for it to start attracting tourists, and it did, and, and we were part of that, you know, um, part of that movement. I mean, we, we brought people down, but our, our resort was, um, was on the beach, and it was tent-based, palapas over, over the tents a sand floor dining room, candle lit, and, and that's what people came down. And we, we had, you know, doctors and lawyers and famous people and, went, and they just came down to be at Kailum, my father's resort at Kailum, because of the same kind of effect where it's like, wow, this is great, a tent on the beach and a candle lit dining room and my toes are playing in the sand while I'm being served Leopoldo's dinners, you know. <laughs> and so, so it was real paradise, but as it got more, more uh, popular, we started losing that and we started being encroached upon and and, and the development just kind of got out of hand and nobody along the way had a grand vision of trying to maintain the integrity of the place trying to ensure that you're not polluting the underground river systems or the reefs or anything like that they want to come in make build a building make a buck and and whatever ramifications from me doing that are really not any of my concern and that just kind of replicated itself over and over and over and over again and the environment in the area has suffered for it and um, creating um, Tanina you know creating Tanina was because we were just feeling like Plato Carmen had lost what was appealing to us in it mm -hmm. and it was just too busy and too much and too commercial and too and so we wanted to get back to or I wanted to get back to what, you know, because Kathy wasn't here at the time, my wife, she was, uh, she came in 95 when it really started taking off. So I just wanted to try to get back to that, you know, God, I want to feel like I'm here again. I want to feel like, you know, I used to feel, I want to feel, I miss that, you know. And and it, it was based on, on you know, real, real simple principle of just, you know, creating a, a, a space that you feel comfortable with and trying to um, take care of the environment and and impact it because you know you're going to impact it but in a way where you're not being disrespectful and you're not sacrificing future generations if you know I mean our grand vision was that our children would our, our children's children would be able to come here and go wow this is really neat and it hadn't changed much you know it just just kind of was was this constant thing because it, it, it was so um, it, it fits so perfectly into the, its environment, you know, and so, so the idea was that if we did it at Tanina, I mean, you created this thing that resonates with people, and that people really feel like, wow, this is really neat, I didn't know this existed, I didn't know it was an option, I didn't know, you know, what to expect when I booked it, but now that I'm here, it's like, wow, this is really neat, you can do that on a large scale, and, and for us, you know, here we have five guest houses, well, with HDB, which is the, the partnership I set up for this venture, it's 1,100 acres. And the Im inspiration is to do it on a large scale, be the shining example of how you can do it better and easier and bring in all these different levels of, of, of social awareness and social interaction and cultural in interaction and, and, um, and do right by the property. I mean, if it's going to be developed, which it is, you could be a beacon of hope of how it should be developed as opposed to how everybody does develop, which is with no regard to, to, to almost anything beyond the profit level.
Right. You know, the, the the bottom line is 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 all they're interested in is how much money am I going to make and how quickly am I going to make it so I can go on and repeat this model over and over and over again elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they're they're killing the golden goose, you know. But by that time, they'll probably have sold the hotel and moved on to the next pristine beach <coughs> and done the same thing all over again. And it's, where does it end? You know, where does it end? So for people not familiar with how a hotel would impact an environment like this, and considering the fact that it's inevitable, inevitable how does your model uh, compare to what traditionally happens with hotels here? Well, so traditionally a hotel would, I mean, just in terms of the development, um, they squeeze everything and more that, that, than it's supposed to be there. So if they're zoned for 200 rooms, you bet your ass they're going to try to get 400 rooms or 500 rooms. So right off the bat, you know, it's, it's a much higher density than was ever designed. But that's how things work here. It all leads back to the almighty dollar. Secondly, they have no regard for the environment. They, I mean, they really don't. It's beyond me why they would want to endanger and imperil their long-term profitability by sacrificing the immediate environment, but they do. They go in there and they raise the property, they build these structures without any regard for how the building is going to impact the environment in terms of like, you know, for example, on the beach in Cancun, they put all hotels on the beach. So it changes the wind patterns and, and so the beach erodes now because the wind has nowhere to go and it's messing with the ocean and the ocean's messing with the beach and then they have to go get dredge, you know, sand to bring in and make a new beach, you know, instead of just doing it right the first time. So the idea here is, is that um, you, you, can, you can create any kind of, of uh, hospitality experience, I mean, all across the board, but just do it much more respectfully and, and, and still make a profit. Um, I, I don't believe you need to go in there and raise the property and, and build your hotel and plant some ornamental plants and call it paradise. I think, I think you, can, you can enhance paradise by, by the way you design and the way you, you, you develop within, you know, this, this, I mean, this jungle is just amazing. You know, it, it, can, it can be so much. I mean, it, you guys haven't seen spider monkeys uh, yet? Did Carl tell you about them? Yeah, he might so, not, so not long ago he saw some spider. We haven't seen spider monkeys in, in a long, long time. We've had... But we, you have all sorts of, um, you know, wildlife out here. And with this 1,100 acres, you know, it's not about getting 4,916 residential lots. It's, it's how can we best develop this to protect the environment as much as we can while still being profitable and bringing all these different elements of, of, of social awareness and social responsibility and, and um, you know, all these different cultural aspects. So I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that they're, we're doing it wrong and there's a better way of doing it. Um, what are the cultural implications as it relates to the Mayans and how most people <coughs> don't have a pulse for what's going on here and what you've seen? Well, w what happens is that, um, you know, th this is obviously the ancient land of the Maya, and so you're drawn here in part because of that, that fact. So we exploit their, their ruins and their land and their heritage and their culture to come down here and drink margaritas and, and have a good time. And, and, uh, and there, where's the connection to the actual Mayan people that are still here? I mean, does anybody think about you know, how their lives have been changed or affected by, by this development? Well, if they dug a little bit, they'd find out that they, by and large, still live in the same level of squalor, if you will, that they did 30 years ago. And Cancun at one point, and, and now the Riviera Maya, undoubtedly brings in 30 cents of every dollar that comes into the country for tourism. Where is the benefit to the Mayan culture? Has anybody built a better volley volleyball court for them? Or a better school? Or, but all these companies have come in, whether they're national or multinational, and profited from the culture and from the Mayans, and they've given nothing back. I've already spoken about the revenue. The revenue is, 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 is kept offshore. All they bring on, on, on shore are operating funds so they can show that they're not making a profit and don't have any tax base. So, so even you know, through tax revenue, they're getting away with murder here. So I think it's terrible that the mines haven't uh, benefited more. <laughs> There's no excuse for it. <sighs> it gets me every time.
I just think it's inexcusable. And this might be, um, you know, just a step in the right direction. Um, righting a wrong. It's been going on for, you know, 35 years. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no end in sight, you know. So doing it in this way is just going to obliterate the, the Yucatan. <laughs> so you know maybe my kids or my grandkids won't be able to come here they're you know why would you want to come a couple weeks I'm going to Acapulco Acapulco's ruined by overdevelopment you know the bay is polluted and you know and there's they're suffering and so nobody did it the right way and so now they're paying the consequence now they have thousands and thousands of hotel rooms and they're just you know anybody please come and stay with us well you ruined your environment you abused it you took your profits offshore you know who knows who the locals were but you know they, they got construction jobs you know and the fat cats got fatter and tourists came down and drank their margaritas and they left total and utter destruction in their wake you know Oh, but Cancun's coming up. So let's go to Cancun and do that. Do that same thing all over again. If you go to Cancun and you go into the um, <coughs> into the lagoon, you know, Cancun is kind of like this island thing. It's connected to the mainland by a couple of bridges. And um, the lagoon is so polluted. So you have people in there jet skiing and sailing and kayaking. They have no idea what they're swimming in. Well, you have... 25,000 hotel rooms that have been polluting by and large straight into that lagoon system for 30 years you know and she's like just why why would you do that to yourself well it's because they want quick profits and it's going to be somebody else's problem well Jesus Christ you know <coughs> sooner or later as a culture we're going to pay the piper and and, um, and I think anything that you can do to, to show people that it can be done better for a better quality of life at more than acceptable profit margins you know it, it, it ought to be um, what everybody strives for you know you ought to be willing to sacrifice some profit for um, not destroying what brought you here in the first place you know so it's um it's just silly that, that we you know s some way I guess we lost you know, it's like the in Indians, Native Americans used to not make any decisions unless they took into account the next seven generations, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's what we ought to be doing, you know. Because all we care about is like the here and now and making a profit now and, you know, and then whatever happens in, in our wake, that's, you know, that's somebody else's problem. Well, yeah, well, it's our problem now. We're living it, you know. So the mines aren't generally employed here in the local hospitality business? Well, if they are, I, I assure you that they, they um, hover around the lower range of, of you know, the, the, the pay scale. I mean, they're masons and, um, you know, and, and groundskeepers and things like that. But, you know, how do you move into somebody's, um, you know, into their, into their land and come to their part of the world that for thousands of years you know uh, they've taken care of and, and lived in and whatnot and have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars come through here and not have anything to show for it you know in terms of the impact for them you know they are no better off today than they were 35 years ago it's ridiculous if you had set up a model to where developer you want to come in and develop absolutely we have a fund to help the mine culture do X Y and Z or this mine community or that mine community you make a hundred thousand dollar donation and you can come in and develop the you know not, not at the sacrifice of the environment but you know what I'm saying is that you could you could have built that into the into the system but it, that's not what you know what drove them what drove them was their own selfish profits without regard for anything or anybody else.
and this is a business. I've got partners. You know, this has to work financially. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't. Right. And I believe it ought to be more profitable because it ought to be more desirable. Therefore, it ought to have more draw and more people wanting to be a part of it and more people willing to pay a premium, if you will, to be a part of it. Um, you know, the penthouse suite at, at you know, $3 million or whatever, you know, is, is ridiculous when you, when you compare what you, you know, what you could do and, um, and the kind of life that you could lead you know, in, in, in a better environment. But people seem to, you know, be drawn to that typical dream of the penthouse or the or the five thousand square foot house or or whatever. You know, we're not we're not anymore that well, I, I think we're turning the corner on that, you know, that just life of excess is just ridiculous, you know. I mean we just have more than we could possibly, you know, need and use and, and we all aspire to, you know, big house and it's like it's more than you need. The impact that you're having, on down the line, from you know every aspect, from the lumber that you're using and the the materials, and the, I mean, it just doesn't need to be that way. You know, you can live comfortably, and and I, you know, I'd rather, you know, we built our house, the the casa, and um, you know, we built it to be comfortable and nice and whatnot, but we built it as a place to sleep. This is where I want to live, you know, with my kids on the lawn and swimming in the pool and eating meals out here. I don't want to live in the house. I want to have a comfortable place to retire to and be able to sleep and, you know, but I want to, you know, I want to enjoy myself and my children, my friends, and, you know, and that's what this does. And, and I think if you design a community with that in mind, it can be very affordable, very appealing, very rewarding. And, and much more desirable than, than having a 4,000 square foot house and not knowing who your neighbor is, you know? So, that's kind of the deal. You guys make me almost lose it there. <laughs> <laughs> I need a, I need a